Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. Now, I've spoken a lot recently about asking listeners to review and rate this podcast on iTunes or whatever platform that they listen on. Basically, to keep the algorithm happy that helps new listeners discover this podcast. And what I've noticed over the last few years is that people that have built a strong following on a particular platform quickly find that they're playing on somebody else's playground and obeying by somebody else's rules. And remember a few years ago when people neglected their websites and ran off to set up their business on Facebook until, of course, Facebook changed the rules and and introduced a kind of pay to play if you really want to reach an audience. And I myself am all too familiar with this because I built a following on LinkedIn and had over 14,000 followers and had articles getting over 100,000 views on there until, of course, the algorithm changed. And now those 14,000 followers don't even get a notification from me anymore. But of course, this isn't about me. I'm not alone here. I hear the same from people on Instagram and YouTube too. The problem is that these platforms are changing the rules, but they're also letting algorithms call the shots rather than their own community that actually makes the platform a success. But thankfully, there is an alternative library. The decentralized sharing platform is actually run by the community. Library is ultimately a sharing platform that uses blockchain technology to enable users to publish material and get paid for doing so. And people using library service can also monetize their published material with its built-in payment system, which, of course, is not run by advertisers like the YouTube model. There's been so many YouTubers that have suddenly found that their content is not fit for an advertiser, so it disappears. So why this new exciting concept really appeals to me because it melds together the technical advantages of both Bitcoin and BitTorrent services for people looking just to share content. For example, for an upcoming project, Library is offering 200,000 LBC, which is their token, for developers to compete to launch their apps, projects and social platforms. And these competitive designs will allow for grant funding through the Library Foundation. And prior to this effort, Library has approved 21 projects and gave out close to 1 million LBC for musicians and for conferences to connect people in India and for video personalities as well as animators just to post their work. So in a digital world where we're all content creators now, I've got a feeling you're going to enjoy this one. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Boston so we can speak with Jeremy Kaufman and he's the co-founder and CEO of Library, the decentralised open source digital media protocol on the blockchain. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Jeremy. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? I am Jeremy Kaufman, the CEO of Library. Uh, I have a background in uh, computer science and entrepreneurship, but since the show isn't really about me and about uh, Library, I'll I'll tell you what Library is. Uh, So Library is a blockchain-based open source protocol that facilitates the discovery, distribution, and purchase of digital content. Now, that's a loaded sentence, so a much simpler way of explaining it is we've created a standard uh, that makes services like YouTube or Amazon uh, possible uh, entirely via open source uh, and in a way that doesn't have the same level of control that centralized platforms have, but still has that same great user experience. Funnily enough, Forbes went a step further and they labelled Library as a decentralised YouTube. I mean, we will people have we'll have people listening both in and outside of the tech industry. Some will be familiar with blockchain and crypto, and others won't. So, can you just set the scene a little and tell me exactly what kind of problems you're aiming to solve with Library? Sure. So, um, the, you know, it, it, there's we're, we're we're solving problems from two sides. Um, so, uh, one, there's a lot of problems with. Uh, centralized platforms. Uh, they take some, here I'm talking about companies like uh, YouTube, Apple, Amazon, even cable TV providers. Uh, these companies take anywhere from 30 to 55 plus percent uh, of the profits to move uh, what is effectively a stream of bits, a movie, a song, whatever it is, from place A to place B. And level one, that's just kind of crazy. That's a lot of money to move bits around. I'm not saying what they do is easy but it's a lot of, it, they're, t- they're taking a very large cut. And then there are also these problems of trust and censorship. Uh, these platforms change the rules uh, on people at any time without warning. To come, people build their businesses on top of these platforms and they're building on top of quicksand. And then there are also problems of censorship. Um, we don't always experience them in the US, although we experience them some. 
Uh, and the, uh, people in other countries experience them a lot more where these countries, you know, uh, are collaborating with governments in, uh, in, in Turkey and China to uh, deliver heavily censored versions of their platforms. Uh, so that's the problem with the, with the sort of existing centralized platforms. I don't know if your audience is familiar with existing decentralized technology like BitTorrent. So BitTorrent has a couple of problems as well. It's a lot of dodgy stuff on there. It hasn't gotten legitimate traction, right? It's uh, predominantly infringing content. There's also problems of discovery. So BitTorrent works great if you have a hash to, and BitTorrent's a wonderful technology, by the way, technologically, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, but it, the network works great if you have a hash, that unique value, that magnet link to enter the network but there's no listing of what's available on it. There's no catalog and a blockchain can solve that problem. Uh, and another thing that's a problem with BitTorrent is it kind of works just because people are nice and I'm all for systems working because people are nice. I love Wikipedia. I give money every year, but if we can have incentives to do the right thing, I think that's a little better than just relying on that. Uh, and so, so we're kind of coming at it from two sides. We think there's a lot of problems with centralized, decentralized platforms. We also think existing decentralized tech has a couple of failure modes. I love the line you use there about building a platform on quicksand because it seems no matter where you build a following now, whether it be Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, you're playing on somebody else's playground and they can just change the rules at any moment, tweak the algorithm, and all of a sudden you're invisible, aren't you? That's that's exactly right. And this has happened, you know, we have um, tens of thousands of YouTubers who are now making their content available on library. And a lot of them have suffered from this exact problem, whether it's demonetization or people coordinated DMCA strikes against them or all kinds of uh, crazy things. You know, YouTube just uh, changed the, the trending algorithms and so they're not showing up anymore or all kinds of things that happen where these people spent so much time and money building up their business and, you know, the floor is... Uh, is pulled out from underneath. So if we do have any content creators or equally publishers listening, what, what are the biggest advantages for them using your platform, would you say? Uh, so it's one that you're going to get, if, you, if, if you're selling your content, you're going to get 100% of the price that you choose. And that's a strong promise because this is a protocol, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not something that we can change unilaterally. Uh, the other is trust. Uh, the, the same kinds of... Uh, um, the same kinds of things that I was talking about where um, we don't, you know, we, we can't change the way that library works without the permission of our users. And that's, that's very powerful, you know, to some extent. And I'll say, I honestly, I get in, in trouble with, um, with the VCs or people on the business side. And I talk about this sometimes uh, because I'll say that, you know, our competitive advantage to some extent is tying our own hands behind our back. Uh, but that's what we've done. We, we've, taken away our ability to do things that other platforms can do and there will be some people listening that will immediately have a light bulb just gone off in their head and want to ask about copyright infringement i mean how are you going to get around that and the potential misuse of the platform by your own users yeah so uh, yeah i'm happy to talk about that it's a it's a tricky subject and we we do have uh, a fairly uh, extensive answer to this uh, on our on our website at library.io as well uh, succinctly, our, our legal advice, uh, which we have gotten quite a lot of because this is a, a tricky question, uh, is that one, since this is a protocol, uh, it's how it, the users who use it in ways that are against the law are the ones who are responsible. That is, HTTP is a protocol, uh, right? It moves our websites around. We don't blame HTTP when someone downloads an illegal file. Similarly, we don't blame SMTP, which moves our email, when someone emails an illegal file. So uh, with protocols, uh, the users are responsible for how they use them. Uh, secondarily, since we do release applications and simply as uh, another thing to do to help uh, fight uh, illegal content, and by the way, there's almost a million pieces of content on the network. To our knowledge, there's something like 20 that have been reported to us as infringing. So it's, it's uh, very little of this has happened. Um, but we... Uh, we are registered DMCA agent with uh, the federal government in Washington, D.C. If we receive a DMCA takedown request, we validate it, uh, and we then put it in our database. We publish them on GitHub, so you can see the ones that we've received. Uh, and then we provide a service that any client that wants to operate legally can subscribe to, and that will then, and this includes the clients that we release, uh, that is the, the graphical clients, the browsers, the end user applications, uh, those those pieces of software won't uh, won't access things that have been reported to us uh, as uh, infringing on copyright or illegal for some other reason. And what's the role of the library token in all this? Is this the reward mechanism or for payment? 
it's um, it's both of those things. Um, you know, a blockchain. If if you need to map map blockchain onto another word, right? What's a synonym of blockchain? Uh, the a blockchain is a database. Yeah. And uh, we, we want to use a blockchain to maintain that catalog of what's available on the network. And you can't have a blockchain work without a token. So yes, the token is used for payment. Uh, yes, we as a company have retained some of the token. We use it for user rewards. So anyone who downloads our software and interacts with the network can get some for free. And you can download it at lbry.io slash get. Uh, but you need the tokens that you can secure that database uh, so that we can maintain this shared catalog that anyone can participate in. Anyone in the world can say, I made this, this exists, come download it. But no one controls what's in that catalog. I think that's a, a, a really powerful and beautiful idea. And we can't do it without a blockchain. And library does pride itself on allowing its users to watch, read, and play in this completely decentralized digital library that's actually controlled by the community. But what kind of feedback have you received? And have you noticed that people have a desire to escape content providers that use algorithms to determine what they can and cannot see and in favor of this new community? Yes, uh, uh, we've had several hundred thousand people uh, access the piece of content via library last year. Uh, our user base is has been steadily climbing uh, and there's a lot of interest in this now i'm not going to claim that we have achieved perfection uh in our user experience or our technology there's still uh, a hill to climb but uh, we're getting closer and closer with every day to matching the experiences that are available via these centralized platforms but via this massively different back end that is this entirely decentralized network and that's what we really want to wed you know and compared to a lot of other blockchain companies which we kind of see it as like being very focused on the crypto markets and crypt and people who already are into this whole scene. We want to really build, you know, consumer friendly uh, experiences. A lot of people who use library, it's their first experience with cryptocurrency. Um, you know, our, our, we don't, you know, so that's, that's really what, where we're aiming as an audience uh, is to get normal, uh, you know, very, very typical people to be able to have an experience where they don't even need to know. Uh, that blockchain is involved, right? Blockchain is not why you do something, it's how. Absolutely, and that's what makes it work better, in my opinion. And I, I have read several comments and suggestions online about making library.io the Spotify alternative and, in result, actually revolutionizing the music industry too. I mean, is that something that's on your radar? And indeed, what is the grand vision for library and how long do you think it will take to bring that vision to life? Oh, gosh, uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, so I'll answer the easier part. Yeah. Music is absolutely on our radar. Um, in fact, we have two community members who are working on a piece of software called Jelly Beats, uh, which is uh, a music client and a music player. Our focus as a company, you know, so first we had to build all of the tech, and then we also chose to uh, create some initial clients because, you know, I don't really believe if you build it, uh, they'll come, or if you build this great technology that other people will build on top of it. Um, we have built end user, end user clients. We haven't just built the protocol. But, you know, you have to do work for each kind of type of content. Uh, and so we have focused a little bit more on video. You can, we have, uh, you can download stuff and you can find, actually, we just launched gaming. So you can now do games and other stuff. Uh, you can always just download the files, right? So it already works for any file. But the user interfaces aren't as friendly for music as I think they could be. Uh, these community members have been working on uh, an experience that's much more friendly for music. And I think they've been doing a great job with it. Uh, to answer the bigger question, uh, which is what's the, what's the grand vision here? Yeah. And I'm probably going to give you a politician's answer on how long it takes. But the grand vision is to have this protocol distribute uh, basically all of this. Uh, I'm going to call it static data. Uh, that's data that's the same for two different people. So when you and I go watch an episode of Game of Thrones, we're seeing the same thing. That's static data. When we load Facebook, we're seeing two very different things. That's dynamic data. Yeah. So. Uh, static data is like 55 plus percent of internet traffic and it's growing. We think library can be a fundamentally wet, better way of moving it around. Uh, and uh, of, so that's a, that's a $20 billion plus market just moving the data. And then you're talking about how much do people pay for rights to the data? And that's a trillion plus uh, a year. Uh, and, and we think this technology, because it cuts out all the middlemen, it represents the greatest share of profits for publishers and has an economic design to encourage completeness and participation uh, can ultimately be used to distribute a massive amount of this content. 
And one of the biggest challenges, I think, in this space, and as well with any technology or new technology solution, is increasing mainstream adoption, bringing in new partners, and also keeping your community happy with regular updates. I mean, how do you get around these challenges? Is, is it really tough? It's, it's definitely tough. You know, when you're building this stuff, as I said, I've, I've, I've said before, you know, we really want these normal experiences. Well, getting a normal experience, like what, how easy something is to do in a traditional web app architecture versus this massive versus this blockchain decentralized backend, a lot of times things take 10, 20 times longer than they would if I was just dealing with a traditional centralized server architecture. It's very tough. Um, we have chosen to really focus on, on getting the, uh, the tech working. And then as, as that happened, and we kind of turned that corner, we've been focusing more and more on getting the user experiences really good. Uh, and so like in our case, we started with a downloadable desktop app, which is obviously a high friction choice. A lot of people aren't going to download apps anymore, particularly on their, uh, on their uh, desktop computers. So we started with that. And now very soon, we're going to have a web version come out. Uh, so in fact, if anyone wants to sign up for that, you can go to lbry.tv. There's just a very simple landing page, but we're going to be going into alpha testing for that uh, probably before the end of March. Fantastic. And if we do have any of your community members tuning into this uh, podcast today, what can they expect from Library in 2019? Is there anything else you can share with us about the roadmap ahead or maybe just leave us with a couple of teasers? Yeah, I, I mean, I can I can share a ton. I think we have 18 distinct high-level goals yeah. uh, uh, for 2019. So let's talk about some of the big ones. I just gave away, and, and by the way, this is all available. We're a very public. We're a very transparent company. Uh, if you go to... Um, lbry.io slash roadmap. You can see the full list of them. Some of the big ones are this uh, library on the web. Uh, we're taking our, we're, we're formally releasing our mobile app. It has been out, hasn't quite been feature complete, and it has been in the unreleased version of the Play Store. Uh, so we're going to uh, push that out all the way. Uh, we have some very exciting community initiatives, including a new website for that, which is going to be lbry.org. Uh, that's a whole plan that I could talk to you about for probably an entire half an hour, but there's some, some very exciting ideas there about um, creating lots of different um, sort of mini communities centered around interests and connecting them together that we've already gotten started on uh, and it's very exciting. We're continuing to work on performance. So performance got way better in 2018, but we still want to target like as fast as YouTube or faster, which is very hard in a decentralized network, although we're getting close. On-ramps and off-ramps is a big problem. So and this one is significantly more legal than technical. So figuring out a legal way that's not, that doesn't cost the company, you know, five plus million dollars uh, in compliance uh, to allow our users to be able to cash in and out without needing to hop through three different third party sites, um, which is really still a big point of friction. And it's a shame that uh, the governments can't make this easier. Well, so many of the problems that you've mentioned today are going to be things that we've all experienced at some stage or another. And I must say that's for the, all the, everyone listening too. So if there is anyone that's kind of intrigued by everything we've talked about today, what's the easiest way to get up and running, find you online, and maybe even contact a member of your team or community if they've got any questions? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very publicly available. In fact, I'll go ahead and just start by giving out my email address if someone wants to shoot me a message. It's jeremy at lbry.io. Uh, library.tech is our new portal uh, for developers and technical contributors. There's a contributor's guide. There's a forum that you can post questions on, technical questions, all of that. Uh, we have a chat room. If you log into that chat room, there's probably five, six, seven hundred 700 people online right now. You can get in there at chat.lbry.io. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're, we have a subreddit. So really, whatever one you like to be on, you can talk to us uh, on that platform. And... That's, I think I named all of them. There's probably more, but those are the good ones. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm reading more and more lately about people that have built a strong following on a platform only to have it taken away from them. So to have a new decentralized platform that's controlled by a community, not an algorithm, is a fantastic thing. So I wish you the best to look for the future. I'd love to keep in contact with you and find out how things are going later on this year. But more than anything, just a big thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Jeremy. For sure. Thank you. I love chatting with Jeremy there. I mean, the Democratize web platform will also base its tokens off of LBC to give users an incentive to start moving their content and own their own URL. 
And this will compete with forums and social platforms. So if you go over to my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, if you go to podcasts, there will be a blog post accompanying this episode. So I'm going to post a link to my YouTube channel on library and also a link to how you can link your own content to and secure your own URL. But as always, I want to hear from you about your thoughts and your insights about all the topics that we've covered today or indeed anything else that is on your mind. And you can do that by catching me on email, techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter at Neil C. Hughes, and Instagram's the same username as well. So like I said a few moments ago, I really enjoyed chatting with Jeremy today. He's really got me thinking about a few things, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. But come and join me tomorrow for another guest and a different topic. But a big thank you for taking that time out of your day to listen to the podcast today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.